Sleuth Hounds, have you ever considered creating your own podcast? Have you been inspired by listening to some of your favorites and thought, I'd love to try this out on my own? Whether it's a true crime podcast like ours, a motivational podcast, or maybe one filled with tips and strategies for those interested in the same activities you are, when Maggie and I first decided to start our podcast, we knew absolutely nothing about what podcasting would entail. But when we found out that the platform Buzzsprout was one for which we didn't need any special equipment, just a computer microphone, some quiet space, and each other, we knew this was the way to go. It is intuitive to use, fun to play around with, and so helpful in getting analytical data about our number of downloads to track trends and from where our listeners hail. Best yet, Buzzsprout is affordable, even by our teacher salary standards. Buzzsprout will get your podcast listed on every major podcasting platform. So, what are you waiting for? Fulfill that dream of yours and start today. If you use our Coffee and Cases referral code, 709643, linked on Facebook and in our show notes, not only will you help support our show, but you will receive a $20 Amazon gift card after your second month on a paid plan. It's that easy. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Now is time for the world to hear what you have to say. Last year, Allison introduced me to Rebus Puzzles, and now I'm addicted. I love the challenge behind the puzzle, the minutes spent trying to solve the riddle, the relief that follows a challenge met. But what about when the answer never comes? While I love Rebus puzzles, there are some that stump me. No matter how long I look at the picture, no matter how many times I say it in my head or even out loud, if I'm being honest, I just can't get it. I can't solve the puzzle and I can't break the code. Picture that on a bigger scale where more is on the line, where the thrill of solving a puzzle might come hand in hand with solving a case. The stakes increase when someone's life's on the line. The FBI has entire units dedicated to cracking codes, people who are responsible for deciphering the riddle and turning what looks like a jumbled mess into coherent words and phrases. According to FBI experts, there are four simple rules to breaking codes. One, determine the language that allows you to compare the text to a specific language. Two, determine the system. Are the words rearranged? Maybe they take on new meanings. Is something a substitute? Three, reconstruct the key. This is crucial because without that, you can't achieve number four, which is to put the riddle into plain text. So what happens when you can't get past step two? There are few codes that cross FBI desks that can't be solved. And today's case is one that's puzzled FBI agents for years. When a man is found dead in a field and is so badly decomposed, his fingers are falling off, a coded note in his pocket might hold the clues to find his killer. But this code isn't like the others. This code's been passed from agent to agent with no luck. Even after it was made public, few helpful hints have come in. You know the drill, sleuth hounds. Let's break this code. This is the story of Ricky McCormick. Welcome to Coffee and Cases, where we like our coffee hot and our cases cold. My name is Allison Williams. And my name is Maggie Dameron. We will be telling stories each week in the hopes that someone out there with any information concerning the cases will take those tips to law enforcement so justice and closure can be brought to these families. With each case, we encourage you to continue in the conversation on our Facebook page, Coffee and Cases Podcast, because, as we all know, conversation helps to keep the missing person in the public consciousness, helping keep their memories alive. So sit back, sip your coffee, 
and listen to what's brewing this week. All right, sleuth hounds, we are in the final stretch. If you are a longtime listener of ours, you know where the next 15 seconds of this episode is going. If you're a new listener, welcome to our show. Maggie and I have been trying for quite a bit to get to 150 ratings on Apple Podcast. We are tantalizingly close with 141 ratings. Being teachers, Maggie and I appreciate the hard work that goes into achieving a long-term goal, and we are so thankful that because of you all, we are so close to checking a goal off of the list for coffee and cases. While we are close, we still aren't there yet. So if you're listening and you like what you're hearing, rate us. It only takes a second to click that five-star rating and just a few seconds longer to tell us what you like most in a written review. Keep sharing, Sleuth Hounds, and pretty soon you will stop hearing us beg each week for these ratings. Just make sure that you follow us on social media, Coffee and Cases Podcast on Facebook or at Coffee Cases Podcast on Instagram. Or as always, listen in each week to know when that bonus episode will air. Now, let's get into our show. On a warm summer's day in June, the body of Ricky McCormick was found between a cornfield and a road in St. Charles County, Missouri. When police arrived on the scene, they found a 5 foot 6 inch tall man in stained nasty blue jeans and a dirty white t-shirt. And he was so badly decomposed that the flesh on his hand was so rotten that his fingertips were falling off and were laying in the grass next to him. And that body was identified as Ricky McCormick. So, how long does it take for a body to decompose like that? So, I didn't, like, look up that specific question, and now I'm going to do that on my phone. But, um, like, I do know that he wasn't out there long enough to do that. Oh. I I didn't know if, like, where you said it was a summer's day in June, I didn't know if, like heat would make it well faster um they so not to give too much away but they basically say that if it was just normal circumstances that he would not have been to the state that he was okay so immediately they know something is odd right okay So, the investigators were confused by the fact that Ricky's body was discovered more than 20 miles, or that's like around 32 kilometers, from his home because he didn't drive, he didn't own a vehicle, and he was reliant on public transportation, and that was not available in the area where his body was found. Yeah, 20 miles isn't like you're going out for a stroll. Yeah, I'm going to go walk 20 miles and be back in a couple of hours. (laughs) So, um, police were actually very familiar with this area. Um, in fact, um, and you all know me, I cannot pronounce names. So, <laughs> in an article by Christopher, we talked about this before the show. I'm going to go with Trito, but yeah, from now on, Trito, Trito. Trito, but we're just going to call refer to him as Christopher because I cite his article quite a bit and it has a long title. So it's just easier if I just say in the article that Christopher wrote. So y'all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> so we're on a first name basis for this yeah. episode with this author. <laughs> yes. um, but that article is called Code Dead Do the Encrypted Writings of Ricky McCormick Hold the Key to His Mysterious Death. Now you all know why I just want to say in the article by Christopher because that's really long. Um, In 1995, authorities discovered a bullet-ridden body of an alleged prostitute that was in an abandoned house along that same stretch of road. And then two years after Ricky's death, state crews were, like, just mowing the grass along the roadway. And about 300 yards from um, where they found Ricky, they found two nude women who were dead. What? Yeah, so, like, essentially, this was, like, just a dumping ground for dead bodies. Okay. So, not the best of areas. No. So, Ricky's body was sent away for an autopsy. Um, But what the examiner found left police even more puzzled. So, as I mentioned before, and we, you know, talked about it a little, Ricky was badly decomposed. Um, His fingertips from the knuckle down had started to already fall off. 
Um, but Ricky had only been missing. Well, Ricky was never actually officially reported missing, but the last sighting of Ricky was three days, like two or three days before his body was found. You should see the look on my face. (laughs) So in two to three days, there's that level of decomposition. Yeah. And they said that like, there wasn't any like extremely hot days. Like it was just an average June day. There wasn't any like real rain or anything like that. That would have kind of pushed it along. So they thought that maybe um, he was like kept in a trunk of someone's car or maybe like in a metal um, storage shed or something and then Mm -hmm. dumped there. But I still feel like that's a very quick. Wow. Like I said, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but yeah. So, The autopsy doesn't really give away much. They're unable to determine his cause of death, um, and they blame the heavy decay as part of that. Um, Pathologists do eventually rule Ricky's death as undetermined, which, okay, like (laughs) everything is, I feel like. Exactly. (laughs) But um, police aren't satisfied with that ruling, and they're for sure that Ricky was a victim of foul play. Uh, Yeah, because, I mean, that's not natural to decay in three days. Right. Like, that alone, I feel like there has to be something more involved than just you had a heart attack on the side of the road. Right. So, despite checking Ricky, his surroundings, and interviewing, like, his family, his friends, and his girlfriend, um, they don't really get any, like, significant leads. And pretty soon, Ricky's case is put on the back burner, you know, as more cases come in to, like, the office and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, with little to go on, police just kind of begin building an investigation around Ricky's past, like trying to find out who this guy is. And they find some pretty, like, weird, to say the least, stuff about oh, no. Ricky. So, Ricky oh, is a high school no. dropout. Okay. Which, which you know, with the does not. De- defy, right. you know, determine your future. Right. He was, for most intents and purposes, unemployed. Also, this is kind of embarrassing, but you know what? I'll show you guys. So, I was, like, basically yesterday's old. That's how when I found this out. That is, okay. it is for intent, for most intents and purposes. Not, in, like, I have been saying that wrong my whole life. What have you said? I think I'm part, I mean, like, intensive purposes or something like I've been saying that wrong my whole life and when I talked to you and I was like I know that this isn't wrong and then I was like holy crap I am so stupid and I teach English that's so funny so I know I have students all the time and they'll type something and they're like like um a lot when they make two words yeah or like instead of saying whether they say rather that's weird. Like they'll say instead of whether or not, they'll say rather, and I'm like, what? This is <laughs> like, dumb, right? That's funny. What are you saying? Yeah. So, so for all that, intents and purposes. Yeah, not all <laughs> intents and purposes. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's unemployed or was unemployed. He was unmarried, um, and he was the father of four children, which we will talk about more in depth in a little bit. So I feel like what you told me so far. I mean, if he's not in school and he's not employed anywhere, then there really wouldn't, I wouldn't think there'd be like a wide range of people who he would come in contact with every day. Yeah. And I read his age and he's not like, wasn't, you know, like old, but he wasn't like super young. I'm going to have to remember um, how old he was. He was 41. So it's not like he's like super old or super young, but like, yeah. You should be established at the age of 41, and he just kind of wasn't. And we talk about that, or I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So he wasn't like most people his age. Um, In fact, his mother used one of the words that, like, I hate the most. There's a gigantic dictionary, so why I choose this word? But his mother describes him as retarded. And the only reason I'm saying it is because that's a direct quote from her. Um, And I don't, and like, Obviously, people use it not the correct way. 
even the, I just feel like you shouldn't use it. There's other ways to describe people in general, but I'm mm-hmm. sure she meant he was just slow um, because in most every article that I read, um, Ricky was described as barely getting by in school, as falling through the cracks, or being just kind of pushed along from grade to grade until he eventually dropped out. Okay. So there Which were like happen, sadly. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, you don't really think about it until you're in that situation, but, you know, by the time kids are in high school, you know, we've mm-hmm. seen, they've kind of just been pushed along and stuff like that, and it is mm-hmm. it is sad. Um, mm-hmm. But some people said that he couldn't read or write, and then other places said that it was, like, on a very, like, childish level that he could read or write, and that he was socially awkward, and not meaning, like, Sheldon Cooper socially socially awkward like doesn't mm-hmm. know how to do social things but like just kind of like he would isolate himself he would stand alone on the playground and kind of ignore when the other kids tried to include him oh no yeah and like again being teachers we see that side of things too and I feel like if COVID has taught us anything it's taught us to value friendships and social interactions because they've been so limited agreed and and you know I know that you see this at your school and I do at mine as well that there are there always seems to be kids who appear to be alone like they're in the lunch line alone and like there's conversations happening around them but they're not like included in the conversations or on you know a dismissal when they're waiting on the bus like the same situation and like every day you want them to find a friend and like you know it your heart breaks a little when that cycle repeats the next day for that yeah. kid and I think that kid was Ricky mm. and his teachers at times did reach out to his family just to see you know kind of what was going on but right I mean like from what I can tell obviously I don't think he had like the most normal or best home life like it I didn't really read anything about that but I mean if you describe your kid as retarded then yeah yeah that's not it's not a good sign no it's not so now it makes sense the unemployment yeah because if he doesn't have the reading or writing ability you know to like fill out an application or or to even have an interview right and and where he would isolate himself you know I, I get that now. And he did have one cousin, um, Charles, that he was close to. They were um, like brothers. And Charles said that um, Ricky almost lived like in another world. Like he would often talk to himself or talk about things that didn't really make sense. Um, and he kind of argues that Ricky probably had like untreated bipolar disorder or maybe even schizophrenia. And so I kind of think, you know, if something like that went untreated. That only plays into like that person being even more isolated because I think kids don't really know how to like handle that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Now don't get me wrong. I don't think talking to yourself, I would hope doesn't indicate mental disorder because I I talk to myself all the time. I was going to say because um, (laughs) I talk to myself all the time, especially if Anthony's like still at work because right now um, my district is virtual a lot of districts in Kentucky are still part way in person and so like um Anthony if he's like at the at the office I'm like okay Maggie let's check our emails and see if Stephen <laughs> emailed us so I get it I know or like I'll even sing it's so bizarre it's so weird I know if anybody heard me I will be like let's see if anyone has texted me <laughs> or like I was walking to get the microphone to record and I'm doing a horrible horrible attempt at a British accent but I was I looked at Rod and I was like, I'm going to go get to my microphone and then I'm going to record. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I have no idea why I do it. So anyway, but obviously what Ricky did was to an extreme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which like, sometimes I'll do that at school too. And like, I'm sure the kids are like, oh my God, this woman is crazy. Because I'll be like, get out your pixel. <laughs> They're probably like, oh my god. Oh no. So basically, Sleuth Hounds, we're weird. Yeah. So now you guys know. That's the best. Yeah. You know. So, this is why we're friends. Yeah, basically. 
<laughs> so according to the Christopher article, so there we are again. Right. Ricky's aunt Gloria um, said that Ricky did actually go see a psychiatrist and like I just feel like this is really weird what she said the psychiatrist said. But basically he said that Ricky had a brick wall in his mind. And Christopher quotes mm-hmm. Gloria as saying, quote, he said Ricky refused to break the wall. He didn't like the life of living poor and had an active imagination, end quote. And I promise mm-hmm. that like this much backstory will kind of make sense when we get further into like the actual case. Mm-hmm. But Again, just kind of oddities that he has. Okay. So, I did say that Ricky was basically unemployed, and he was. Um, He did hold down, like, you know, a few side jobs from time to time. Um, At one point, he was a, like, he mopped floors. Um, He was a dishwasher. He was a busboy. He worked at a service station. Um, But Ricky also drew a disability check for a chronic heart condition a chronic heart condition and Mm -hmm. maybe because you know Ricky preferred to be alone or maybe it just fit his lifestyle better when he was working he preferred to work the night shift and in that Christopher article his aunt actually said that he was a vampire because he would sleep all day and then come up with the sun and I feel like that's kind of yeah they're kind of (laughs) thing. oh man but I do feel like that's true of a lot of people that don't have like Um, a very big social life I do feel like they tend to sleep more during the day and then be up at night time like I kind of just seen that as a trend Mm -hmm. so I mean like anybody that knows me you know that I love to sleep I don't obviously stay up all night because again I love to sleep but like if my day could just naturally start at 10 o'clock like I would be the world's happiest person like (laughs) I need at least like I mean during the school night I probably or week I probably get like six to seven and a half hours of sleep but on the weekends my husband and I don't have kids right now and I take advantage of it like if I'm rolling out of bed at 12 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday I'm like oh, yes success, yes. success. <laughs> success. <is> so good <laughs> like I love it but I don't think I would be described as a vampire no, no, I could never. But you know what's weird? So obviously, Sleuth Hounds, Maggie and I are a lot alike in a lot of ways. Um, that's one where we're not alike. I'm a morning person. I could see that for you. Yeah. I'm, you know, when I my alarm goes off and I get up at, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock. Because don't you cook? You're, are you a breakfast cooker? Like you cook breakfast? Sometimes. Sometimes. But once I'm a, a, awake, once I roll out of bed, I'm awake. I do say, though, I do have to say, though, like, the older I get, the more guilty I feel the longer I lay in bed. Oh, don't feel guilty. Sleep in. I know. And I'm like, I'll catch myself on Saturdays, like, making myself get up at, like, 9 or 10. And then I, because <laughs> I feel so bad, because I'm like, I'm an adult now. Like, I should be doing laundry or, like, <laughs> cleaning something. <laughs> no. You need the rest. But I... The, uh, the last thing I would call you, though, is a vampire because okay. of your. That's, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, something that I think does kind of hold a little bit of significance in this case is the fact that Ricky didn't have his driver's license, so he had to hitchhike. Um, mm-hmm. And we know, you know, most of, that a lot of the cases that we read about or that we've covered people that are hitchhikers tend to meet nasty ends some of the time. Right. But um, I didn't really read anywhere where police speculated Ricky's incident was like a hitchhiking adventure gone wrong. Hmm. So, so far, I feel like Ricky's life, you know, has been a little odd. Right. But now the ghosts in Ricky's closet are about to start emerging because we're about to start talking about how Ricky became a daddy. Oh, no. Okay. So, in November of 1992, Ricky found himself in court facing charges of first-degree sexual abuse. Oh, no. Because the mother of Ricky's children was a girl he'd been sleeping with since she was 11. (gasps) Yes. Oh, my. Yes. That is no, no, mm-mm. and like wow. So it gets even weirder because 
in some of the articles that I read, like, okay, one, she's 11. Like, I was playing with Barbies at 11, so, yeah. like, that's gross. Um, but a bunch of the articles that I read mm-hmm. said that, like, Ricky's mom and aunt knew this girl by her nickname, which is Pretty Baby. So I don't know, like, is that a nickname? That's even more disturbing. I know. Is that a nickname he gave her? Or, like, is that a nickname, like, oh, like my aunt, like my family calls me Gee because I don't know why, but they do. So, like, is it a nickname, like, everybody called her that? Oh. Or, like, was that his pet name for her? Because if it was, and, like, they knew that, and they knew the situation, like, it's just even more I have cold chills. No. It's disgusting. Oh, Oh my goodness. If they knew, they deserve to face whatever punishment. I hope that he, well, did he get charged with something? See, I don't even think those charges are enough. Well, he did. He has no idea. No idea what is going on. Yeah, it grossed me out. And, like, when I read that, I was kind of like, this dude... I feel like there definitely is some undiagnosed mental problems with this man. Yeah. So, I mean, so regardless, okay, this girl is now 14 at the time of his trial, and she's given birth to two children by Ricky mm-hmm. at this time. Okay, also, where is this girl's parents? I didn't even think about yeah. that just now. Yeah. Because he would have been, this man would have been in jail a long time before my child turned 14. Well. Absolutely, because my little sleuth hound is 11. If you think that I'm going to let her be with some adult male. Oh my God, it's like that one show on Netflix where that family knows. Oh my God, what's the name of that? That the the girl like is being abused. It's based on a true story by her. Oh my God, oh, oh I'll find it. You're going to watch it. It, Anthony and I watched it and the whole time I was like I know these people are not this stupid but they find out that she's being sexually abused by their neighbor and they just like he kidnaps her and they're like they pretend like it's fine and then like he says mm-hmm. my therapist says that I need to sleep beside of her to help with my anxiety and this is after they already know that he's like had like been abusing their daughter and they're like okay sure come on in I oh. mean and like the whole time I'm like I know these people aren't this dumb I'm going to share it with I'll find it and I'll share it with wow. you wow but let me say this too as a parent to an 11 year old I am not I'm probably the least violent person you will ever meet in your entire life it's true but if someone harms my child I I'm capable of anything yeah I'll just leave it at that so he he does go to jail for all of 13 months. Oh, my goodness. And he later goes on to father two more children, though I don't think it was by this girl. I didn't see who was the mother of his other two kids. But, yeah. And I would fear, too, if he's been with a girl who's that young, I feel like there could be a trend. That's true. So obviously, if there's an attraction to a child... Ugh. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, so, so back, to, back to Ricky. Yeah, back to the case. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ricky, you know, we're back to the beginning, has been found dead. The badly decomposed body, police are baffled, and all that stuff. So, what could have possibly happened to this recluse of a man? Like, I've got it. Oh. Battery acid. <laughs> no, I don't oh, know. I was, I was like, thinking like, what could cause somebody to decompose. Oh, that's and true. And then maybe somebody was angry. Maybe they found out about him with, being with this. Maybe it was the daddy of that girl. Yep. girl. <laughs> that's my theory. Okay, you tell me. You tell me what you know, and we'll okay. see if my theory holds up. <laughs> so there are some claims that Ricky was tied up in drug activity, and that he died as a result of like, um, kind of like a drug deal or a drug like a message gone bad Um, believers of this theory cite that in the weeks leading to his death that Ricky made a few random trips to Florida Hmm. and according to the woman he was dating when he died her name is Sandra Ricky made those trips to pick up marijuana and so Uh, that seems weird why can't you get listen again I'm not an illegal 
drug user. <laughs> We're not I drug lords. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the first clue where to find marijuana. Yeah, I don't even know that I would know I what it would look go, like. Yeah, my guess is I wouldn't have to go to Florida to get it. Right. Yeah. So he go. He's making these trips, and that's what she thinks he's going for. And you know. She says that he regularly accepted offers to pick up and deliver packages for money. So that kind of le- lends credence to this theory that maybe he was like a courier of drugs or notes. Um, mm-hmm. She does go on to say that like in the weeks leading up to his death that he seemed like kind of unsettled or scared. And we'll kind of talk more about that behavior in a little while. Okay. Okay. Um, But the Christopher article says, like, it's unclear who Ricky went to meet when he went to Orlando on his last visit. But there were phone records that show both he and his girlfriend made a significant amount of calls to several places in central Florida um, before his arrival, which would kind of, to me, be like they're kind of planning things out. Mm -hmm. And then Sandra and Ricky exchanged a similar string of phone calls during the two days that Ricky was in Florida and that he made at least one phone call to the St. Louis gas station where he worked. And there were some articles that said the gas station might have been, like, kind of shady and been involved Uh, with this type of stuff. Okay. So, according to Sandra, Ricky, like I said, did accept offers to, like, pick up packages and money. And, like, I just feel like that's a big red flag. Like, Mm -hmm. every time in any movie... When you meet someone and they're like, take this letter to the corner of 7th and Waller oh, Avenue. Yeah, that's bad news. Yeah, you're a delivering drugs person. Like, right. you don't know it, but you are. Um, so that's why you don't put somebody else's luggage in the airport. Oh, life lesson number two. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, was it possibly somebody, like capitalizing on Ricky's like maybe kind of disabilities or mm-hmm. like how naive he was or mm-hmm. am I just really naive and try to see the good in people and like just assume people are kind of taking advantage of him when really he knew what was going on but the the marijuana story is credible because Sandra says that he would bring the marijuana back to smoke which like you said if you're going to purchase marijuana I mean, not. I'm assuming you just would do that in your own neighborhood or city. Right. I don't think you would have to go all the way to Florida. But no. he would bring in Ziploc bags full of marijuana bundles that were like the size of baseballs. And so to me, that is like, I feel like that's a drug dealer status. Like, I don't know, yeah. but like, I don't think the like normal user has a baseball size thing of marijuana no. Like all I've seen in movies, it's like real, like the joint. Yeah, or like just Which little. A lot. Yeah, not a baseball size of it. No. So, Ricky returns from his last Florida trip just about two weeks before he dies, and it's then that people really start to notice the change in his behavior. So, as Sandra said, um, he starts acting different, kind of like if somebody were to be after him. Um, I know I mentioned that Ricky did have some serious medical issues and he starts seeking medical attention in the days leading up to his death, almost as if he's using the hospital as like a refuge of some, of oh, some kind. like they're not going to come get me if I'm in a hospital. Yeah, because around mm-hmm. 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 22nd, um, June 22nd, 1999, Ricky goes into Barnes Jewish Hospital's emergency room complaining of chest pains and shortness of breath. And if you have ever had chest pains, I had to go to the ER with chest pains um, because I thought I was like literally having a heart attack. And it is scary because they like rush you straight back there. You have to take x-rays of your heart. And my mother lied to me and said they wouldn't give me an IV and they did. No, no. So just so you all know. Right. Um, so you're gonna get yeah, you're gonna get stuck with a needle. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ricky did have that serious heart condition, and he did have asthma. So his visits with these complaints were not unusual. He had been a pretty frequent visitor to the ER with similar complaints since he was a little kid. 
Mm-hmm. So he told his doctors he didn't abuse drugs or alcohol, which his family backed up. But we obviously know is a lie because he smoked marijuana right. with Sandra. Uh, and has baseball-sized marijuana yeah. balls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> marijuana balls. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that tells you how uh, streetwise Allison and I are. <laughs> I know. And several places said that despite his health, like his heart issue and his asthma, Ricky was a chain smoker and would drink oh like goodness. up to 20 caffeinated beverages a day. What? Yes. Like, I I'm talking about his heart I'm did not like Two cups of coffee and a soda. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much caffeine I'm drinking. <laughs> no, I hardly ever drink soda. And if I do, like, if I have a Mountain Dew, Anthony can tell. He'll be like, did you drink a Mountain Dew today? And then I'll be like, maybe. And it'll be like 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm in the bed and I'm like, okay, it's time to go to sleep. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> do I want to rearrange our house? <laughs> yeah, let's paint something. <laughs> so Dr. Zoo rule out out a heart attack um, but they do keep Ricky for observation just to kind of be sure and they keep him in the hospital for two days and he is discharged on June 24th and um, they do give him uh, like orders for a follow-up visit but he never makes those appointments mm. so now this next little bit I mean like if you can put behind things we know about his past it does kind of make me feel sorry for him um after he leaves the hospital he goes straight to his aunt gloria's house so the one who talked about like his experiences with the psychiatrist Mm -hmm. um and in so many places that i've read it said that despite the fact his own mother lived around the corner he preferred to visit with gloria and was actually much closer to her than he was his own mom Mm, and I mean, I, we kind of saw that with the names and the... Yeah. And I do kind of, like, understand that. I do feel like aunts and uncles are able to form, like, a special bond with their nieces and nephews. Because it's, mm-hmm. like, their parent, but they're also, like, almost on a friend level at times. Because I know, like, when I was younger, things that my mom would say to me, like, if my aunt said it that I was really close to, it almost took on, like, a new meaning. Because, mm-hmm. it came, because it came from my aunt and not my mom. Right. Um, so according to the Christopher article, it said, quote, everybody needs someone to talk to. And this is Gloria talking. Now and then, she said, Ricky would come and visit and talk with me. But according to Gloria, he revealed very little about his life, the problems that he might be facing or like what he was doing in his just day-to-day activities when he was with her. And Sandra Mm -hmm. said the same things about him. Like, he just didn't really reveal a lot. Not a lot about his trips to Florida. Not a lot about, like, what he was doing day-to-day. So, just very, like, recluse and just, like, kind of private. So, basically, all we know is, like, speculation. Yeah. Basically. So, around 5 p.m. on the next day, which was June 25th, Ricky entered the emergency room at Forest Park Hospital, which was less than two miles from Barnes Jewish Hospital. Um, And a little tidbit of random information, if y'all don't already know, I'm, like, obsessed with abandoned houses and hospitals and, like, libraries, just, like, abandoned schools, like, all that stuff, like, the thought of... The things, like, the memories that are there or, like, the life that this building had just kind of, Mm -hmm. um, like, really intrigues me. And um, this hospital was abandoned, like, in the mid-2000s, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. And I literally spent, like, 45 minutes looking at pictures (laughs) and watching videos of people (laughs) touring this place after it was abandoned. And it looks like it's kind of straight out of The Walking Dead. It's very, like, like when he wakes up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of creepy. And, like, one time I made Anthony, um, back in eastern Kentucky, a, it was a hospital in a town. And then they used, turned it into, like, a nursing home. And then it had been abandoned for a while. And they were doing, like, an auction of the stuff inside. I made Anthony. And you could, like, go in and look at the stuff. Oh, yeah. Of course, we weren't going to buy anything. But I was like, let's go. I want to go through this old hospital. And I was like, Anthony, let's just buy it. Because it's such a pretty building. And I was like, we could live here. We can make it a house. And he was like, oh, my um, gosh. I you're go. nuts. He was like, yeah. people have died here. All right. I'm with Anthony on this one. <laughs> so we just buy it. And I was like, you could turn it into such a cool like bed and breakfast. And you could do like haunted houses and stuff. He was like, you're so stupid. 
<laughs> so unlike the last ER visit, when Ricky was complaining about chest pains, this time he comes in and says he couldn't breathe, um, which, you know, he has asthma. And doctors just right. kind of um, chalk that up to an asthma flare up. He isn't admitted. Um, he's released around six o'clock that afternoon. Um, and it's actually not clear when he left the hospital. Gloria in a couple articles said that he actually spent the night in the waiting room and then left the next morning, which kind of, again, points to him using that the hospital as kind of like a safety net. Right. So Sandra told police that she talked to Ricky on the phone at 11.30 a.m. on the 26th, and he said that he was going to go to the gas station, get something to eat, and that, you know, everything was okay. Um, the last sighting that we have of Ricky was on June 27th. And so the day is, after. So the day after that, and he was leaving the gas station and had no idea that his death was only, like, days away because he's full, so we've come full circle now, has been found dead on June 29th. Okay. So those, like, last couple of days for him were just hospital visits and... Right. And that's about it. That's about it. So, Ricky's case does stay pretty cold for the most part. Um, so cold, in fact, that FBI, the FBI decides to take a huge step forward and let the public in on some, like, sensitive case information. So right, they, which usually they don't do, right? We talk right. about that. Like, they'll keep information back so that way they'll know if someone has insider information. Right, and what they release is very big in Ricky's case. They sit, they tell the public, and this is in 2011, so Ricky died in, Whoa. yeah, like, what was it, 1999? 99? Yeah, so it's, like, it's a while. They tell the public years. Mm-hmm, that they actually found notes, like, on Ricky's body that were, like, encrypted. They're coded. And so they wanted the public to see if they could crack the codes because the FBI wasn't able to crack the codes. Um, wow. According to the... Which is crazy, and I will... You will find out why in a second, because I was like, holy crap. So, according to the Unsolved Murder of Ricky McCormick, to date, the FBI crypto analysts and racketeering records unit, which is called CRRU, have been mm-hmm. unable to decipher the baffling note, and they feel like this note could help solve Ricky's murder. Dan Olson is chief of the FBI CRRU unit, said, quote, It doesn't happen often that we have an unsolved cipher of this length and significance. The characters are not random. There are many E's, for example, that could be used as a spacer. There are many characteristics that suggest it could be solved, many patterns. The problem is we don't know why it's not solvable, end quote. Ooh. I know. There's I'm 30, intrigued. So there's 30 lines of this coded text, including numbers, letters, and parentheses. And mm. it's, it's like, it's weird. So it turns out there are actually a ton of theories about who could have, you know, created this code that was found in Ricky's pocket. And I'll go into detail about those in a second, but this puzzle has stumped the world's best code breakers. People around the world remain like just baffled about this. It's actually on the FBI's list of, it ranks third on the FBI's list of unsolved cases, only behind, like as far as codes, only Mm -hmm. behind an unbroken code by the Zodiac Killer in 1969 and a secret threat letter that was written to an undisclosed public agency about 25 years ago. So if you Google, like, the CCRU's unsolved codes, Ricky's is third. Wow. Yeah. Okay, now I need to see it. Yeah, I will definitely post it um, so that you guys can see it because, I mean, I feel like if anybody could break it, it it's going to be one of our sleuth hounds. Oh, totally. I love riddles, too. Oh, yeah. I feel like this would be, like... And logic problems? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like... Yeah. As far as, like, the Rebus puzzles go, I tell you all, like, I really do. Like, I will sit, and I've, like, started with my kids at school. I'll put Mm -hmm. them up sometimes for them to do, like, especially if I can find, um, like, 
if it's like Halloween, like I'll put a Halloween one up or something like that. Um, and like, I'll sit and stare and stare at them. And sometimes I can't get them. And then like, I'll finally figure it out. And I'm like, duh, like it's so easy once you finally figure it out. So, um, the FBI typically, and this is why I was like, what? They usually unlock the meaning of codes in just a matter of hours. Wow, hours. Quick. And this is, so P.S. Sleuth Allen's Allison and I are not recording together right now. So I'm going to send her um, a text message with a link to an article that has those um, codes in there. Okay. But like, so we're a couple of hours and this is like 11 12 years later so right. you, they're desperate and right. like unlike the rebus puzzles where i can google the answer they cannot google <laughs> the <laughs> answer. got a little too excited <laughs> i was gonna say i maybe they were sending it thinking like there's some secret code with friends like did you do that when you were little oh yeah like have a secret language or whatever but I feel like no kids could come up with a code that the FBI can't break. Yeah, exactly. Like, (laughs) which again, like one of the theories, you're going to be like, I don't know, because I just don't know. So, um, so I totally was not picturing. So Maggie just sent me the link and I was not picturing Ricky McCormick the way he looks. Yeah. I did not either whenever I was we'll post this picture. Like he just looks like like average dude. Like I just Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess we say that every time. They just look like an average person. So I'm looking at the code and it's like little paragraphs almost with like circles around the different Hearts. And there's like no spaces to indicate different words. So it's like you know a letter has to be a space. Right. But then, I mean, there will be like, on one part of it, it'll say like, I'm looking at the second picture. And there's like short phrases and parentheses. And it'll, like, I see a 71, and then the, in the line below it, I see a 74, and the one below it, I see a 75. Yeah, and they... So like, years or something. Yeah, and they run those numbers, um, like, well, I'll tell you. So, um, Dan Olson goes on, like, quite a bit, of, he does quite a bit, of, a bit of explaining in that Christopher article that I've been citing, um... But he walks us through, like, his steps to break the code in that article. And he says, when McCormick's code originally hit, like, in that article, it says, when McCormick's code originally hit his desk, Olsen attacked them as he always does, counting characters and looking for patterns. So just kind of like what you were doing. He attempted Mm -hmm. to break them down naturally with graph paper and a pencil. He dissected the strings of letters and numbers on whiteboards amid the acrid whiff of dry erase markers. He employed computers with state-of-the-art software to perform statistical analysis. Olson worked on the codes for a solid two weeks, and he got nowhere. He even brought in other analysts to look at and brainstorm ideas he consulted experts for clues he compared the letters and numbers so like how you almost said there's like a pattern they looked to see Mm -hmm. if that could possibly have been like street addresses in st louis they looked at maps across the country um but they didn't really hit anything substantial it was more just all kind of like coincidence Mm. like have you ever okay so i buy this is like the best gift for me ever. But uh, those puzzle books like you can get in the grocery store. But I love every puzzle in it. I love like silacrostics and the logic problems and things like that. But there's one type of puzzle that's a cryptogram. 
And it's what you just said. Like, it's basically like code breaking, but for dummies. You were not like, you know, the FBI, CRRU. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you'll have to look and you say, okay, well, if the letter, letter R repeats a bunch, it's likely a vowel and a more common vowel, like an E. Yeah. And so you can like, and then, but it gives you a category. So it'll say like, I don't know, flowers. And so, so you kind of can narrow it down a little. Right. Exactly. So you could try to figure out, you know, which flower it is. And, but you do have to kind of see if you can see patterns, look for common letters, which likely again, represent a vowel or like an S or a T or something like that. So basically, tomorrow, Allison is going to have this solved, is what she's saying. <laughs> I'll have it solved by tomorrow. No. Yeah, on Friday, <laughs> it'll say, <laughs> Allison solved. Right. It's Ricky. Right. I just took a look at her lunch, you know. Yeah. <laughs> In between grading papers, right. I quickly right. glanced at it and <laughs> solved it. You're welcome, world. Right. Um, so there are the theories behind who has written the notes. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I think I talked like three or four maybe. Um, so one is what I think we all kind of just naturally want it to be. Like we want this note to be by the murderer if he was murdered. Like, you know, the part of us that loves the mystery wants it to be that the murderer has like put some kind of secret clues into this like code. Um, and there are law enforcement agents that believe it is the killer but then there are also Mm -hmm. people who kind of think that the code was planted on ricky's body to serve as a red herring to distract police away from locating the killer which i had never thought of because i guess my brain doesn't work like that but i was kind of like that's genius in a way i mean it's absolutely genius but then at the same time i feel like like who thinks of that as a red herring like who, who is like you know what Let's put a code on him. Let's just draw that, words. Right. Let's just create something that's completely <laughs> random and hope it throws them off. And then, like, like I get, you know, I get if they put, like, I don't know, a, a, a random key. Yeah. Or like, like a hotel that doesn't key. take a lot of thought or time. But something like that, I feel like. I don't know. And then, like, in 2011, when that's released, they're like, told you this would work. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it paid off. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are, like, people that hold to the theory that Ricky wrote the notes. So, this is actually the most popular theory. And even Dan Olson says, quote, it is done in more of a format of something written to oneself than something written to someone else, end quote. So, according to the Unsolved Murder of Ricky McCormick, that article that I talked about a little earlier, um, Ricky was obviously known for concocting tall tales and, you know, his, like, display of unusual behavior. Um, He was also reportedly, like I said, only semi-literate, and some believed struggled with learning disabilities and mental health issues. Um, You know, if you remember the word that Ricky's mom called him. So... Most people believe that Ricky wrote the note in a shorthand that he developed over the years. Um, And if that's possible, this note may never be deciphered because, like, I think I've said this before, but I always read my case to Anthony before Allison and I record it, or at least try to. And he kind of talked about, like, if Ricky was, um, like, you know, handicapped or had a learning disability, then he might not even spell correctly. So, yeah. like, he might spell round, like, R-O-N-D, and leave mm-hmm. out the U, so we would never know that to be able to decipher a code written right. by him. You're right. Which I was like, he said that, and I said, huh. Or it could even, like, transpose letters, like, yeah. you know, maybe it's supposed to be, I don't know, uh, like, maybe he just... Uh, and in, but it's written like a U because it's written upside down yeah. or, or something like that. So, you know, perhaps that's why the FBI can't get past the step number two, which is determining the system that she used. 
So there is confusion regarding whether or not like Ricky's family kind of stands behind the capabilities of him writing this note. Some members of Ricky's family said that he could read and write um, or that he could, sorry, that he could not read and write. And there was absolutely no way that he would have been able to form a complex coded message. There are other family members, though, that said Ricky had been writing in his own, quote, secret language since he was a Ooh. child. And this is kind of what you said, like when you make up like coded words with your friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, this little tidbit of information from that um, Unsolved Murder article, I was like, this is weird. But then Anthony was like, no, it's not. But unfortunately, we don't have any existing like handwriting samples of Ricky's. And at first I was like, that's really hard to believe. Like you don't have a grocery list right. to throw down. You don't have a telephone right. number. But then Anthony was like, you know, if he wasn't like comfortable writing down things, he's going to avoid writing them down so there probably wouldn't be anything to compare the note with so the third theory and i'll lie to you all this is the last theory um, <laughs> was that ricky was like curing which i think is a very hard word to say it's a lot of vowels right. um the note so the unsolved murder of ricky mccormick article states um cryptographer Alonka Dunnan contends that Ricky, this is a quote from that article, likely didn't write the note. Instead, after taking into consideration, into consideration Ricky's education and background, Alonka suggests that he may have worked as a courier for coded messages for criminals. However, if Ricky was killed because he was couriering notes for nefarious people, it seems odd that the killer would have left the note on his body to have it found right. by police. End quote. Right it's point. true. Like, why, if he is carrying back the code and, like, you're trying to let your other person know like we're gonna meet here to do this deal or whatever you won't want police to find that but I do kind of feel like we know I do feel like maybe we know he was curing drugs so why would this be a crazy theory I don't know yeah I don't know. but they do think that this note could if cracked give some sort of indication of who he thought might be after him they think that if the code is cracked, that they will essentially it will help them solve the case. They've said they don't know if it will give like locations, maybe, um, maybe people that they need to be like looking at or looking for, or people that were with Ricky or the people responsible. But um, everything that I read said that police think that this code is the key to this case. All right, well, Slew Towns, let's get cracking. We all love a good riddle. We love working hard to solve a puzzle. And the code in Ricky's pocket are among the hardest codes left to crack. These codes have stumped the best code breakers in the world. But I know you all can solve this case. You can break this code. Just remember the four steps. One, determining the language used. Two, determining the system used. Three, reconstructing the key. And four, reconstructing the plain text. If you are able to crack the code, you're urged to contact FBI Laboratories, Crypto Analysis, and Racketeering Records Unit at 2501 Investigation Parkway, Quantico, Virginia, 22135. Attention, Ricky McCormick Ace. Good luck, sleuth hounds. Again, please like and join our Facebook page, Coffee and Cases Podcast, to continue the conversation and see images related to this episode. As always, follow us on Twitter at Cases Coffee, on Instagram at Coffee Cases Podcast, or you can always email us suggestions to Coffee and Cases Podcast at gmail.com. Please tell your friends about our podcast so more people can be reached to possibly help bring some closure to these families. Don't forget to rate our show and leave us a comment as well. We hope to hear from you soon. Stay together. Stay safe. We'll, we'll see, see you, you next week. week.